why is this gonna be so much fun? Why? Because now we're ready to look at stocks. Sexy stocks, exciting stocks, <laughs> risky stocks. Yeah, I know, no more boring bonds, folks. This is where it's at. This is where we get to participate in the growth and the dynamism of the great American economic machine and now the global economic machine. And we can see that it can make us very wealthy, but it can also make us very sad as described by this uh, popular email that was circulating around the internet in 2002. If you had invested $1,000 in Nortel Networks, you don't never even heard of them, have you? But they were one of the hot stocks of the internet bubble at the late 1990s. If you had invested $1,000 in Nortel Networks stock last year, you now would have $50. Instead, if you had purchased $1,000 of Budweiser beer, drank the beer, returned the cans, you'd have $78. So our stock tip for today is to start drinking heavily. Now, folks, it doesn't end. It, it's a cycle. In 2009, this same email was circulating around the Internet. But instead of Nortel Networks, we were seeing AIG and City Poop, City Group. And yeah, what's the next one? I don't know. Maybe next year, two years from now, we might see the same email with uh, Titter and uh, Tesla and who knows? Netflix, high flying stocks have a tendency, not always though, to crash and burn and make people very sad because. As we're going to see, emotions play a very, very um, important and, and dangerous uh, part of our stock uh, selection process for many people, but not for you. That's why you're here. You're going to learn how not to let your emotions make the be take the better of you. Slide number two. Uh, slide number two. Yes, there it is. <laughs> what are our stocks? You know, I don't even like the name. I wish we would use the name businesses because uh, that's what you're investing in. A stock represents part ownership in a corporation. Stocks are equity financing, which equ you sometimes hear people use the term equities when they're talking about stocks. It means you own, you're part owner of the company. Whereas when you buy a bond, you're not an owner, you're lending your money. So that's why we call bonds debt financing. And we also call bonds fixed, if you remember, because we know how much money we're going to get, assuming the company or the corp, the uh, entity, the, stop, the uh, state or local government or the Federal Reserve doesn't go into default. So that's why we call bonds fixed. But stocks are open-ended or closed-ended if the company goes out of business. Why do corporations issue stock? Why, why do they even bother? Well, they want to raise money to start or expand a business. Or, as in the case of many of the businesses here in San Diego, which are um, uh, uh, biotech companies, and it might cost $500 million, $800 million to get that drug to market, they have to keep going out and buy, selling stock because no bank or, or nobody's going nobody's to lend them money or nobody's going to buy their bonds. It's just too risky. They, they, if that drug is not approved, the company's going to go poof, and the stock's going to go poof. As a way to gain prestige and respect within the industrial community. Once your company is large enough, it's just expected that you're going to go public. And, uh, and um, for example, there was a great example with Google. They really weren't sure they wanted to go public. The folks who started Google, they were making money hand over fist. And uh, they were sort of, oh, I don't know, we, we think you got all that paperwork and all the legal stuff that you have to deal with and then wall street came and knocking on the door and, and started waving billion dollars numbers in their in their face and and they said okay let's go public <laughs> and it's done very very well and of course if you have a firm that is this large how do you take money out of it i mean how do you sell a small piece of a billion dollar company when you own whatever 5% or how you sell that. Well, stocks make that much, much, much easier. It's not impossible, but it, it is difficult 
because whereas you have to find somebody with a large you know wallet to to buy your piece of the company when you move into stocks millions of thousands or millions of investors can pay you off and this is what happens when a company goes public the uh, the initial uh, investors or the people who started the company they become multimillionaires in some cases billionaires so you're going to live breathe eat sleep this company for 6 or 7 years and then maybe go public but there's no guarantee that you're going to succeed because for every one google you're not even going to hear or some of you and I don't even know about uh, uh, Lycos and, and Alta Vista and Dogpile and Go and Ask Jeeves and all those other companies that tried to compete with Google and all fell by the wayside. So it's, it's difficult. And in the case of stocks, the corporation doesn't have to repay the money. They sold a piece of themselves to the world, and unlike bonds where you have to repay. But now the corporation is a public entity. And what does that mean? They have certain responsibilities that they must do. For example, if you are a public company, you have to tell the world every three months how much money you made and how much what your expenses are. And there's a there's a set methodology for this. And if you're into accounting, it's it's a it's more exciting than just accounting, in my humble opinion. So think about it. You might want to go into corporate finance and uh, and help the corporations keep their ducks in line because if they don't, they get fined and they could go to jail for for misrepresenting their uh, their finances because it's a public company now. The public needs to know the truth. Okay. Why do investors purchase stock on slide number three? Well, you purchase stock to share in the success in the corporation. Although you're, you are now part owner of the business, your liability is limited only to your investment. Huh? Well, if you have a sole proprietor, and you'll learn all about this if, when and if you take Business 120, Introduction to a Business. If you and the business are one and the same, and that's what we call a sole proprietor, or you're in business with somebody else, that's called a partnership, you and the business are one. So that if the business has all kinds of, racks up debts of all kinds of debts of all, for example, liability for somebody falls on your floor and you're a shopkeeper, whereas you're, you're responsible, they can come after you, they can come after your house. Whereas a corporation, you hear of the corporate veil, You a corporation, the stockholders are only uh, uh, on the hook for how much they invested. So if you bought one share at $100 and the company goes bankrupt, that's it. You lose your $100, but they can't come after you for more money in case the corporation had more debts. And what do we get in from re our rewards? What are our rewards? Well, we get income from dividends. And we don't often talk about dividends, but dividends are very important. And we'll discuss those in detail later. These are earnings distributed to the shareholders. Now, you can think of them like interest, but they're very different. Legally, they're two entirely different things. The corporation does not have to pay dividends. They can. Some corporations have been paying dividends for decades, but other corporations don't pay any dividends. And so you must know this before you go. You think about a stock. And then here's the thing that everybody does uh, think about, and that's the dollar appreciation the capital gains or capital losses. You buy a stock for ten dollars, you sell it for twelve or twenty or a hundred, and that's what people um, get really excited about. And then we talk about the possible increased value from stock splits. There is no increased value from stock splits, dear students. It's an accounting maneuver. You had say you had one share at a hundred dollars. And they split two for one. That means they're going to give you two shares. Yippee! What happened to the price? It went down in half. So now you have, whereas you have one, you used to have one share at $100. That's $100, one times 100. Now you have two shares at $50. That's still 100. It's a psychological increase at best. And a Warren Buffett has refused to split his stock since its inception. And now I think, actually, I should change it. I think it's higher than 280000 I think I, I, I should have checked that. 
Um, but his he 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 just always thought it was it was a gimmick. But there's reasons. There's reasons. There's there's technological reasons which are no longer um, uh, viable. And then there's there's psychological reasons. Some companies will will um, split their stock as a way to tell you, you know what? We think things are going really, really well. So so we're going to split our stock, but we're not going to tell you that things are going really, really well, because if we do and then they don't, we can get sued. So so about, oh, I forget how many years ago, uh, Qualcomm split their stock, but they didn't make any other announcements. And I said to my, I was in an investment partnership at the time, uh, the investment club, as they call them. And we had owned we owned Qualcomm. And I said, you know, I think this is this is the, Qualcomm's trying to tell us something that, that things are well. And they did. They did really, really well. But that was a long time ago. Now they're doing really well, well again. But they're involved in all these court court battles. I don't know about. I haven't followed them as much as I should have. We sold that a long time ago. Okay. So uh, so that's why investors purchase stock. Now, what are the historical returns? What can we reasonably expect from stocks? Well, historically, stocks have returned 8, 9, 10%. That's what I tell people. Actually, some have done better, okay? <laughs> some have done a whole lot worse. Traditionally, half of that return was from dividends. You see, stockholders used to expect 4 to 6% in dividends each year. That was as much or often more than the bonds returned in interest since stocks were considered much riskier than bonds. In the 1980s, 1990s, dividends fell, 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 fell to 2%. And then finally to the bottom, they've never been this low be again, 1% in 2000. Now we're talking aggregate. Remember, some companies don't pay any dividends. Some companies pay a lot of dividends. Because people kept saying capital gains were what people wanted. Then they went back up over 2%. And now they're a little bit below 2% again. But think about it, folks. Banks are paying 0.01% or 0.5% if you're lucky. So so I guess stocks aren't such a bad deal, right? But people don't think about dividends. We will. We will learn how to calculate dividends. We'll see what dividend yield. We'll learn how to calculate dividend yield. And we'll see that dividends are very cool, in my humble opinion. The last 10, 12 years, people have not been interested in dividends. They've been more interested in growth. But the pendulum swings. Speaking of pendulum swinging, slide number five. If stocks are the best long-term financial investment, how, they're, how come they're considered so risky? Well, it, it's our emotions, dear students. For two decades after the crash of 1929, stocks were regarded as gambling by a majority of the population. This impression wasn't fully revised until the late 1960s when stocks once again were embraced as investments but then in an overvalued market that made most stocks very risky. Historically, stocks are embraced as investments and dismissed as gambles in routine and circular fashion, usually at the wrong times. Stocks are most likely to be accepted as prudent investments at the moment they're not. Now, who said this? One of the best money managers in the world. His name is Peter Lynch. He's, he, he retired from investing a long time ago. But he was, he's, he's a genius. And he, the guy is a real down-to-earth kind of guy. But he's absolutely right. He called it his cocktail party theory. He was a money manager for, for Fidelity. And he ran the very famous Fidelity Magellan Fund. And did, I mean, just he just crushed it. He made everybody else look lame. And he's just, you know, he's plain talks, plain speaking kind of guy. You can look him up on the internet and listen to him, and, uh, listen to interviews with him. And he said he called it his cocktail party theory. He would go to a cocktail party and the people would all be talking and he'd say, oh, what are you? Oh, I'm a doctor. What are you? Oh, I'm a lawyer. What are you? I'm a, um, I'm a, um, I'm a money manager. And they'd all move away from him. <laughs> he worked in a mutual fund. They all move away. Well, I, because stocks had done really poorly. And he thought, okay, this is a good time to buy stock. Okay, because nobody else wants to talk about them. Then he'd go to a cocktail party and he'd say, oh, what are you? Oh, I'm an architect. What are you? I'm a money manager. Oh, really? Do you have any good tips on good stocks? And then he knew, okay, stocks are probably fairly valued now. It's time to hold. 
And then he'd go to a money, he'd go to a cocktail party and he, oh, you're an engineer. That's great. What are you? I'm a money manager. And he goes, oh, really? Oh, well, let me tell you about the stock. My buddy just told me about, I don't know what the name is, but the symbol is ATIV. It's supposed to double in eight months. That's when he knew, okay, time to sell because people now, when people are giving the money manager tips, you know, <laughs> it's time to sell. And sure enough, the market would crash and then they go back to the cycle of people all moving away from at the cocktail party. It's okay, it's time to buy again. You don't believe me, do you? Well, let me look. Let me show you here. Because on slide number six, what you're going to see are the rolling 10-year periods. These are look not at year to year we're looking at 10 year period this happens to be the dow jones industrial average we'll discuss later on but it's a, it's a measure of st how well stocks did and so if we go back we're coming out of depression here's the depression here and we see 10 year periods where the stock market actually went down you put you put a you put a thousand dollars in come back 10 years later you know you disappear for 10 years and it's down not a whole lot but it's down and then here we are coming out of the um the um, uh, Great Recession in World War II, and stocks went in two directions in the 1950s and 60s, up and way up. And then what did you hear people hear? What did you hear people say here when when it was it had done almost 20%? Oh, 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 is it too late to get in? It, yeah, it's too late to get in. Now's the time to be selling because what happens next? 1960s we have the the civil unrest and we have a uh, uh, vietnam and the country's being torn apart because of that that um that um that war and the culture wars where where uh, you had the older generation the younger generation fighting amongst themselves and 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 civil rights and women's rights and gay rights and and then you had the 1970s which were even tougher with the uh, the first oil um, uh, uh, crises and Watergate and stocks almost went negative, but they didn't. They didn't actually go negative. They went and just barely touched a zero. But still, after 10 years, you would have done a whole lot better putting your money in the bank. And what did you hear people say? Oh, is it too late to get out? <laughs> Yeah, now's the time to get in. But emotions play such a, a big role in people's decisions, or at least they do in some people's decisions, but not you, dear students. After the next few weeks, you will understand that emotions are not to be even thought of when you, you, when you invest. You must do your best to not even think about the, how you feel about your investments and realize that if... If stocks go to zero, I mean, if we lose everything, assuming we buy, you know, high quality, and we'll discuss the difference between some high quality and low quality stocks, uh, that means the economy has has dis, has is gone. Basically, there's no food at the Vons, there's no gas at the Chevron station, there's closed the gap, the cell phones don't work, and the water supply is 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 either gone or it's dangerous the, the the trash isn't being picked up the sewer system's backed up the the hospitals the the schools the, the banks the the fire departments the police departments are all yes failure is not an option <laughs> and so if the world continues as it is with changes it's always changing but capitalism might be the worst economic system economic system humans have ever created except for all the others. You just hang in there. Because what happened? Sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, here come the 1980s and the 1990s and go-go technology and globalism and, and, and new productivity and computers and, and the internet and, and the sky's the limit. And look at the stock market's gone in two directions, up and way up, and you had almost 20% returns. And then you hear people saying in the year 2000, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Yeah, right. Because <laughs> then the internet bubble burst, and then we moved over to the housing bubble, and that burst, and you have to go back to the Great Depression to see negative 10-year returns, and you saw them at the end of the uh, Great Bubble run-up. 
in uh, the uh, the uh, internet and the housing bubble 2009 2010 and what did you hear people say <laughs> you, you figured this out yet Ooh, is it too late to get out yes that was the time to be buying and sure this sure enough the cycle starts again now is it going to do the exact same thing i don't really think so i think it's not going to go as high as it did. It's not going to repeat this cycle again. But you don't know that. And I'm not worried about it because uh, I'm just investing and hoping and praying and believing that we humans are not going to die in our own waste, blow ourselves up, the tsunami, meteorite, earthquakes, who knows, COVID, disco could return. Oh, folks, you just don't you see you're too young you don't remember disco it was a very difficult time men were walking around in high heel shoes we didn't call them high heel shoes and i never wore them but it didn't last very long about six months and guys realized that hey you can't walk in these things how do women do it okay so the news is good if we have a long-term perspective if we just ignore the ooh, ooh, ooh is it too late to get in Ooh, is it too late to get out then uh we should do well but there are no guarantees, right? I had to add that, didn't I? Okay, slide number seven. What are the risks? Okay, let's talk about the bad stuff. Well, the company could fail. It could disappear from the face of the earth. Uh, you ever hear of uh, Enron? <laughs> Some of you probably have never heard of it, but not 20 years ago, it was the biggest uh, uh, failure ever. I mean, this was a company that was going to just revolutionize the energy industry, and they... They were lying. They were literally, literally just <laughs> putting debts on their books as assets. They were saying that these were this was a liability they had to pay, but they said it was an asset. And everybody thought, "Wow, this company's great." And I'm gonna the market. The market as a whole could plummet. No, not could. Will we know it has? History tells us that it will. We just have to remember that you know, as long as we get on, get up, put our pants on, go to work produce the goods and services that keep us all alive that will will survive the global investment risk well this is when you invest outside the united states and traditionally most other countries did not have the same standards of accounting as the united states but that's all changed many have better better standards of accounting in the united states you know they've they looked at us and they basically said you know what that's not me some too we want to do what you're doing and they were able to fix some of the problems that you know we we haven't because um they saw us and and copied us and made it better so we have to turn around and look at them and go you know okay yeah that's not a bad thing to do and then the currency fluctuations. Now, this is very subtle, and I don't, I don't know if I ask you. I think I might ask you to remember this, but, but we discussed this in detail in Business 123 Introduction to Investments. Whenever you invest outside the United States, you have to remember that the, the U.S. dollar is not something that just is static. It, it rises and it falls. And as it rises and falls, it changes the value of your investments outside the United States. And it's, it's one of those, remember the bonds and interest rates go down, bond prices go up. It's the same seesaw kind of thing. If the dollar gets stronger, that's great for us going overseas and, and uh, traveling or buying uh, goods from outside the United States. But our investments outside the United States automatically become uh, worth less. If all the things stay the same and they never do. But if I have a house in, in Mexico, and some of you might have or have relatives that have a house in Mexico, and the dollar gets stronger, well, that house is worth less. Why? Because when you sell it, now some places in Mexico, they do all transactions in dollars for real estate, but, but let's say you sell it in pesos. Now it takes more pesos to buy those same amount of dollars. But if the dollar gets weaker then my investment outside the United States is automatically worth more. All, all other things being equal, and they never are. So now it takes fewer pesos to buy those same number of dollars. And the dollar has been very strong for the last several years. And there's a few reasons. We, we don't need to discuss the reasons why. So it's a great time, in my humble opinion, to buy foreign investments. Um, but, you know, people disagree with me. They say, oh, no, 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 it's a terrible time. You know, stay away, there's too much risk. But the rest of the world has is, is, is doing, you know, well, COVID has put a huge monkey wrench into that. 
but the the rest of the world was doing the best they could to to mimic us and create a better standard of living for their people and it sounds like an advertisement but i'm serious <laughs> i am absolutely serious you know we want the rest of the world to do well we don't want people to be living in squalor and abject poverty because it breeds all kinds of horrible things yeah anyway i'll stop there now also a liquidity risk that's not a problem with stocks usually unless you go for these penny stocks which are very very dangerous and we'll do our best to keep you to stay away from them but somebody wants your 100 shares of mcdonald's somebody wants your 50 shares of nestle's you know foods it, it, it you can sell it right away normally and get the money cool unlike real estate which is a big problem with um, not in, insurmountable but a definitely big problem with real estate is not a liquid investment okay how can we reduce the risk of stocks well the problem is risk is difficult to measure it's even more difficult to anticipate but emphasizing large company stocks which pay consistently rising dividends has been one of the best strategies for reducing risk why because when the market falls these companies do pretty darn well when the market is screaming higher and higher and higher they usually sit in the corner and kind of you know not, not do so great and it's all the growth stocks that are exciting which has been the last 10 years but i'm a big fan of large companies pay consistently rising dividends and then diversification is another major strategy and we've talked a little bit about diversification we'll talk about it in detail when we get the mutual funds uh, you might have heard the betterinvesting.org they used to be called the NAI, uh, NAIC maybe not but that's the group that sponsors investment clubs they have their five stock rule of thumb you buy five stocks one will do poorly and make you sad <laughs> three will do about average you know they'll follow the market up and down and one will explode and make you happy and this is what i've found you know you buy five or ten say they buy ten stocks and you really need to diversify at least the ten stocks Two of them will do, bleh, you'll go, yeah, well, that was a big mistake. Two of them will do really, really well, and the rest will just sort of do what the market's doing. And that doesn't mean it's going to always happen that way, but it just seems to happen that way. And then time, as we said, over time, stocks have done very, very well. Why? Because the global economy now has been growing and and that's a you know we, we it's a it's a sort of a hard concept to think about but that means people have a better standard of living and they can they can now they have money in their pocket for the first time they can afford clean water and they can afford healthy food and they can afford clothes for their kids and they can afford uh, nikes and and toothpaste and they can they can buy uh, disney characters and they can buy a cell phone and they have a, a satellite dish and now they have a television and maybe they're going to buy a motor scooter or maybe even a motor car and and yeah i know it sounds like an advertisement for but for com for capitalism but it is i'm i remember i'm a stockbroker i i believe in this system and i think it's got its biggest big problems that we've got to fix we have to do something about the inequality because if we don't you know as Mar martin luther king says riots are the voice of the unheard and we're just going to have more and more unrest and that's not what we want we want okay enough okay let me continue my apologies slide number nine it does certainly it has not helped the cause of stock investing that there are many many scams out there ready to take your money one of the oldest and still most prevalent prevalent is called pump and dump pump and dump it's a very simple scam they take this stock it's basically worthless and then they start throwing around rumors and lies and innuendos and spam emails saying this company is going to do great it's going to be fabulous look it's only selling for 0.01 cents i mean and it, but it's going to go up to three cents and that's a 30 time or uh, 300 time it's, it's going to it's going to make you rich 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 and then you buy some and then you get your buddies to buy some and they raise the price a little bit and you get excited and they and then they raise the price a little bit more and then you get even more excited and your buddies are not buying it and everybody's getting rich 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 and then they disappear and then you try to sell it there's nobody there <laughs> they were they were hiding behind the internet they were behind behind the system and selling you more and more shares and raising the price to make it look like you were making 
tremendous sums of money and uh and then they just they just disappear and the price plummets now i've had people say well what if i play at their own game huh what if i play at their own game and i say look you know the game, the game is rigged against you it's the old saying if you're at the poker table and you don't realize who the patsy is at the poker table you're the patsy right you're the sucker who's being scammed so just stay away from penny stocks slide number 10 and then occasionally investors get caught up in what are called manias also called bubbles i think you hear bubble more than you hear mania but i like the word mania the internet was the latest stock market mania now some people are saying that the fangs you might have heard of the fangs facebook apple um amazon netflix google and who's the uh, last one micro now they're throwing in microsoft in there because these companies have just been inflated to huge valuations and so they're saying that's a that's a mania some people are saying there's a mania in bonds i don't call it a mania it's just a, it's a, i don't know what to call it it's it's um it's uh i don't know what to call it because it's not being it's not being fueled by individual investors it's being fueled by governments so maybe that's a mania but before that before the internet mania in the late 1990s, there was the Nifty 50 of the early 1970s. These were companies that you just don't even have to worry. You go ahead and buy Polaroid. Polaroid? Or, or, or I mean, why would you buy a company that, sound, that rhymes with hemorrhoid? But anyway, Polaroid, you might even heard the name, but they're long gone. Xerox, where are they? Uh, uh, Calcomp and Tektronix, you never heard of those. Uh, Metro Media, uh, the, one of them was... Um, avon avon stock had just exploded and then they, they all crashed the mania of the 1920s caused the crash of 1929 and who were the the internet stocks of the 1920s radio corporation of america you, you, you've never heard of radio yes you have it, it was commonly referred to as rca and it went to 290 dollars a share and then three years later or four years later 1933 yeah four years later it was two dollars a share from 290. in the 1840s there were 400 railroad firms how many are there now well the, the that's about three or four big ones and there's a few other ones but the granddaddy of all manias and some people dispute this but the Dutch tulip bulb craze of the early 1600s. That's, you heard that right. Tulip bulbs were traded like stocks. And at one point, a single bulb sold for the value of a house. But other people dispute these, so, so it's hard to know. But, but definitely there was a, there was a, a, a mania with, a, with, with, a, with regard to tulip bulbs. They had been imported from Turkey, I think, from Turkey. And the Dutch now are still famous for their tulips. Each time the phrase was, it's a new era, it's different this time. The old ways of valuing stock are gone. And each time they were wrong. There's a wonderful book called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. It was written in the 1840s, but it still shocks how stupid we are, how gullible we are. <laughs> And I had a student say it really well. Uh, it's easier to fool 100 million people than it is to fool one person. Because in a crowd, we have the tendency to go crazy. And so read it. It's fun. You'll love it. I, I trust you. I trust me. I read it. I thought it was a blast. Slide number 11. Taxes. Now, why do you always have to talk about taxes? Well, again, the news is good. If we hold our stock for a year and one day, we get taxed at a much less rate than if we buy and sell and buy and sell. Another reason why you should hold on to stocks for the long term. Whereas if you hold the stocks for less than a year or less, then you get taxed as if it were income. All right. So that's high, a higher rate. So it's very, very happy. Makes very wealthy people very happy. And dividends were traditionally taxed as income. But now, again, they are taxed at that same low long-term capital gains rate, which, as we said, has been a huge windfall for the very wealthy. Uh, the, if the pendulum swings back to uh, you know, hitting people, the wealthy, harder with taxes, these will probably be higher. But still, they're, 
you, you you're happy when you pay taxes why because it means you made money <laughs> yeah the, 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 people complain about paying taxes i say i know way you don't have to pay any taxes on your stocks how do i do it how do I do it? give them to me i'll pay the t- <laughs> yeah, right. yeah right okay um the slide number slide number uh 12 how do you buy your stocks well the traditional brokerage firms uh would would uh would charge a lot of money for their, their services and uh we'll discuss the um how the brokers make money now but then along came the discount brokers and then sometimes called the deep discount brokers the internet brokers which are started in offering trades for you know 10 bucks five dollars now some are offering free trades don't believe them they're not free how are being charged how well just take business 123 and we'll discuss how you're being charged but you're still being charged don't 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 think you're not being charged and but there are other low cost options uh like the um the um, um dividend reinvestment plans that you can get through individual companies mostly large companies or from other entities such as the betterinvesting.org folks that are uh, coupled with a company called folio investing to allow you to do dividend reinvestment plans. And what are these? Well, these are uh, systems where you don't pay, um, you pay a very small amount of money if you pay anything at all. I remember we used to have one, we, we, every once in a while we'd be charged six cents or five cents and it was great, you know, no, 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 uh, no commissions. And they reinvest your dividends automatically in more shares, which is very cool. And again, we'll just, this, we discussed this in detail in Business 123, so let's not get into the details. But it's just a very, very cool option that that makes uh, trading, which not I shouldn't use the word trading, investing, buying and selling of stocks very cheap. And then you can uh, keep your stocks in certificate form. Don't do it. Please do not do this. This is for the kind of people who stuff their money in the mattress. But... These certificates now, which are basically long gone, everything's electronic, make collector's items, believe it or not. And so there's a little presentation on the on the uh, the uh, in in Canvas and on WonderProfessor.com that shows you some of the certificates of the past. And it turned out that that uh, people were buying one share of of McDonald's, not McDonald's, of uh, Disney of Disney. And then they were asking the, the their broker to send them a a, a a a certificate of Disney because the Disney ones were just so good looking, you know, they were really pretty and really well done with all the Disney characters. And so Disney stopped showing them and said, "This is ridiculous. You know, this is it's a lot of work for for just somebody to to have a certificate. So now you have to go out and buy old ones that people have collected over the years. You know, they're not worth anything now. They're they're just they're like Beanie Babies now. They're just collectible items." They don't really uh, represent ownership in in Disney anymore because they've been they've been like a check they've been used, so check that out. I think you might like it. Slide number thirteen. So as we said, how are you going to be charged? Well, traditional brokerage firms will assign you to an account executive, sometimes called a stockbroker, financial planner, financial representative, account uh, account representative. These are licensed individuals who buy and sell. Um, securities mostly stocks but bonds also and mutual funds and and a few other things uh for their clients you get personalized service and you're going to pay for it right you're going to pay for it well they were traditionally paid by commissions but that's going by the wayside now and now they're being charged uh, you using what are called assets under management and folks I understand you know there were unethical brokers who would churn their accounts Meaning they would excessively get their 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 uh, they would get their clients to excessively buy and sell and buy and sell just to generate commissions. But there were few, very few. I mean, uh, there were very, there weren't that many. But the, of course, it gives all the stockbrokers a bad name. So now, oh, we're not your brokers anymore. We're your asset managers. We're going to charge you one or maybe even two percent a year to to manage your accounts, and you pay no commissions. Well, folks, that can wind up costing you a hell of a lot more over time than just simply buying the uh, pay, buying the stock or selling the stock and paying the commission. But we'll discuss this in more detail as, when we get to Chapter 13. 
Um, and because it works the same way with mutual funds. Now, what about uh, the the deep discount brokers? Do you get any kind of help? Well, some of them have these automated systems that people say are great. There's one called Think or Swim that I, a couple of people said, "Oh, it's great," but you know, you don't you don't get to talk to anybody. If you do want to talk to a broker before you make a purchase or a sale, they'll they'll charge you an extra twenty five thirty dollars or whatever it is. But um, but the one company that I actually admire is Schwab. I think they actually do a good job by their um, employee, their um, their customers. So check them out. Okay, and you can research your potential broker or brokerage firm at finra.org. Go ahead, type, go to finra.org and find broker check. I think it's called, and type in Piano, P-A-I-A-N-O, and see what you get. Right, you'll see me on there. <laughs> no disciplinary action, folks and over 20 years mm -hmm. okay anyway okay so now what we're going to do now is we're going to spend a little time talking about the different types of stocks what do you think are you ready for a break okay breathe deeply in and out and maybe take a break and then come back okay so are you back oh good all right now <laughs> because people just tend to think that all stocks are the same and nothing nothing dear students could be further from the truth Stocks are not all the same. Companies are always different. There are some that cluster around a certain industry and maybe they're very similar, but there's others in industries and you, you, know, you look at them and you say, well, they're very different from one another, even though they're kind of doing the same thing. So, so let's take a look at the classifications of stocks. And the first classification we'll discuss is blue chip stocks. Now, blue chip stocks are typically companies that have been around for decades. Right. These are companies that are, are are have their roots deep in the economy and they're relatively safe investments. Remember, they're they're still stocks, so they're still risky in strong and respected companies often referred to, but not always the same as value stocks. And they attract conservative investors. There's nothing to do with politics, folks. I'm not, not talking about conservative or liberal. We're talking about people who do want to invest in stocks, but don't want as much risk as the high growth high or smaller companies. And so General Electric used to be the bluest of the blue. And they've not done as well the last some 20 years. Some, some people might say, well, they're no longer a blue chip stock anymore. AT&T used to be one of the bluest of the blues. And then AT&T kind of went by the wayside. And now this is the new AT&T that was actually purchased by one of their spinoffs. Southwest Bell, yeah, SBC Communications, Southwest Bell. And so um, and so you can't always expect blue chip stocks to stay blue chip stocks forever. How about Coca-Cola? Well, well, you can't, that's the most popular brand name in the world, Coca-Cola. But people are drinking fewer and fewer cups of cans and bottles of fizzy sugar water with a brown crayon stuck in it. So Coca-Cola is starting to see the handwriting on the wall. They have to reinvent themselves some way, and they're trying, they're trying. Okay, so so who are the blue chips now? The Walmarts of the world, right? Who else? Home Depots of the world, um, Exxon Mobil. Well, now the energy companies are sort of taking it on the skids. So would you include the Fangs, the Facebooks, the Amazons.com as blue chip stocks? Well, McDonald's would say, hey, they, they haven't been around 20 years. Okay, how about income stocks? These are companies that pay higher than average dividends. They are normally slow growth companies in mature industries. And who are we talking about? Utilities. SDG, any going anywhere, folks? San Diego Gas and Electric? No. People don't want to take cold showers in the dark. So... They don't do really, really well when the market's screaming higher, but when the market goes down, right, you know people are not going to want to take cold showers in the dark. And banks. Banks for many, many years were stodgy, boring, reliable, kind of like bonds. But then they got really exciting and started doing really stupid and crazy things in the 1990s and the 2000s, and then we had to bail them all out. And now, thankfully, they're becoming stodgy and boring income oriented vehicles cool so you start to see some differences now let's take a look at the growth stocks 
on the other side of the, the tracks are the growth stocks. These are the stars. They are, they are earning above average profits of all firms in the economy. Their growth rate is 15 to 20% or higher. And it might not sound like a lot, but if you grow at 20%, that means in two, three, three years, you'll be twice as tall as you are now. Often no dividends at all or a small token of dividends. Why? Because the profits are being reinvested back into the company. They need the cash to grow the company. The stock price should go up as business grows, but usually they're very volatile. What did we say about volatility? You bought the stock for $11.88 and you sold it for 30 cents. Yeah. What are the examples? Intel, HP. Wait a minute. Are Intel, HP, and Microsoft growth stocks anymore? Well, not like they were 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Microsoft is doing pretty well in their um, their cloud business. But Intel is feeling the heat, folks. They are really feeling the heat. They're being attacked from all sides. Qualcomm and then who's that other company? AMSL, ARM or something like that. And then, of course, AMD is always nipping at their heels. HP, Ooh, what's going on with HP? Well, they're tr struggling to survive also. So who are the growth stocks today? Right, the fangs, as they're called. The, the, um, the Farcebook, Medusa.com, Amazon.com, uh, uh, Apple, Apple, and, uh, and Titter, and, and, uh, and Google, Google. Those are the growth. Those are the stars. Those are the stocks we hear most about. But you got to be careful. Because you're riding a, a swift horse, and if you fall off, <laughs> if all of a sudden the horse goes up lame, the stock price falls very, very hard. But these are the companies that most people are interested in. They're the stars. Now, what about cyclical companies? Oh, cyclical round? No, no, no. Cyclical companies are companies that follow the business cycle. And of advances and declines in the economy. What does that mean? Well, when the economy is doing really well, people are getting raises, new jobs. What do they go out and do? They go out and buy a new car. <laughs> uh, what's wrong with the old car? I don't know. I like that new car smell, right? If the economy is not doing well and people are losing their jobs, are people buying new cars? No. So you can watch and you can watch these uh, automobile companies. And you can see them follow the business cycle. Economy goes really well, they do really well. Economy does, com economy does really badly, they do badly. And so it turns out that most all companies that make stuff, materials, timber, chemicals, steel, and now computer chips, right? Because everything has a computer chip in it. The more stuff that is built and created, the better these cyclical companies do. The less, the fewer things that are being created, the, better, the worse they do. And then on the other side of that coin are defensive stocks. Now, now we're not talking about defense, not talking about uh, companies that make bullets and guns and bombers and submarines. We're talking about companies that make food, like Kellogg's or, 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 um, or uh, consumer staples, as they're called, toilet paper, um, uh, uh, soap. Right, uh, shaving cream, Procter and Gamble, Tide. They make Tide, and Pfizer is a company that makes drugs. If you, if the company economy is doing well, do you take more insulin? No. If the economy is doing badly, do you take fewer doses of insulin? No. So these companies don't do that well when the stock market is skyrocketing, but when the stock market's falling, they hold up better because people still need their goods and services, and then. We have a category called speculative. These are companies that are very, very dangerous, folks, but they could make you rich. And the, the, the poster child for this company the last year has been Tesla. It's gone up, what, five or six times in one year? And then you might have heard of Kite Pharmaceuticals or Juno or Bluebird. Who are these companies? These are the companies that are going to cure cancer, folks. I'm not kidding. They are working on it. They are doing it. And, and we're going to see what actually Kite Pharmaceuticals got bought by Gilead. And I think Juno just got bought or maybe Bluebird got bought. Anyway, because they're going to do it, folks. But... One or two of them is going to fall by the wayside. That's the problem with that. This new technology, you know, somebody's going to do it. You just don't know who. And Tesla, boy, is that a 
you know, students would ask me a few years ago, how's Tesla? What do you think about Tesla? I said, either they're going to be the most spectacular failure in the history of the, of our economy, or they're going to be the most spectacular success. There's no, there's no either way. And it looks like they're becoming a, one of the, the great successes of the 21st century. So let's hope, let's hope, let's hope for them. I'm, I'm rooting for them. I almost bought their stock, but then I didn't. Oh, well. <laughs> Slide number 17. What about turnaround stocks? Who, what kind of companies are these? These are companies that have fallen on hard times. And I like to refer to them as goners because most of them, once they're falling on hard times, they don't, they don't usually rebound. But there are examples. Chrysler in the 19, early 80s, 1980s, early 1980s, almost disappeared. It almost disappeared. Their cars were so poorly put together. And then a gentleman by the name of Lee Iacocca, uh, took over and brought them back. Now, this guy, you can read his autobiography. He was a really interesting guy. And uh, he was the guy who actually, when working at Ford, started the Mustang. Yeah, the Mustang that's still being built today from 1964 or whatever. So it was a very popular and, and, and fun car. And then out, after the Great Recession, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, all three almost disappeared. All three. In fact, GM did disappear. And the new GM is a different company. And Chrysler was bought by Fiat. And that figured that one out. But, but Ford was the only one that didn't go through bankruptcy. And they have survived. Now, they've got a new, a new challenge coming ahead of them. They have to electrify because people are realizing that electric cars are actually better than gas cars. Isn't that something? If we can just build enough of them. Uh, asset plays. What are asset plays? These are companies that are sitting on a, um, an asset that, it, that they could sell. And a good example of this is JCPenney's, which is, folks, I don't think it's going to be around much longer. I don't know how much longer it's going to be around, but, but I like it. You know, I, I hate shopping, and, and, uh, I, I, but it, my wife takes me to JCPenney's to buy clothing for me because I hate, I hate going shopping. And, um, they, but it looks like Macy's, JCPenney's, and those kind of companies because they're being hit from both sides. They're being hit from the top by boutique and whatever, you know, very high-end places. And they're being hit from the bottom by the, by the Walmarts and the Targets and the Amazons. But they have this insurance division that they could sell called Stonebridge Insurance. These are the people who sell you the, the baby insurance <laughs> that you don't need. And they could sell it to keep afloat. And they were in trouble about, I don't know, freaking how many years ago, but... But they could have easily sold that, that insurance. And maybe they will. Well, actually, they will be. They're, they're being bought. J.C. Penney's right now, at this time, is being bought, being purchased by the mall. There's, I don't think it's going to work out, though. The mall operators. Because the mall operators do not want pennies to go under. So they'll have these huge, or Macy's. They don't want them to go under. So we'll see what happens with that one. But if they are bought, they'll probably sell off the insurance company. Uh, and then penny stocks. These are... Folks, stay away from these companies. They're 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 not real companies, folks. Have you ever seen the Wall Wolf of Wall Street? This is what this guy was selling. He was selling these garbage stocks that are worthless, basically. Somebody's garage in Iowa or Idaho or one of those places that begins with the letter I. So just stay away from penny stocks. Oh, oh, oh I know. Okay, it's time for a recap now. So now that we've looked at these several different types of stocks, let's see if we can identify the companies and what kind of stocks they are. Now, some companies uh, fit in more than one category, and some companies don't fit in any category, or, they, or they're just sort of they're little oddball companies. Have you heard of Johnson & Johnson? Folks, it's a very old company. They make Band-Aids. And Q-tips and baby powder and medical devices and drugs and they're yeah they're a very big company. What would you call them? Well, yes, they are a blue chip company. They are a blue chip company. Are they a growth stock? Well, sometimes they get a new drug that that grows the company, but mostly. They are a defensive company because everybody needs Band-Aids. You, know, you don't put more Band-Aids on because the economy is doing well. You don't put fewer Band-Aids on if the economy is doing poorly. And they've paid dividends for many, many years. So you could say they're an income stock, but that income's not that great. What about ExxonMobil? 
Again, another storied company. It's been around for over 100 years in one way or the other, on a form or the other. It used to be Standard Oil. And yes, they are a blue chip stock. But what do we know about oil? It's very cyclical. Indeed, when the economy is doing well, oil is one of the basic agreements in, in almost all materials and, 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 and uh, not all materials, but many materials, plastics and, and, um, and um, synthetic materials. Uh, 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 drugs use a lot of oil. Uh, chemical uh, plants use a lot of oil. Uh, uh, fertilizers and pesticides. Yeah. And then, of course, gasoline. So, uh, so it's very cyclical. How about Google? Yes, Google is one of the poster children for a growth stock right now. Oops, that was a mistake. The growth stock. So, uh, yes, they're, 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 they're one of our... Are they paying dividends? Yes, they actually are paying dividends, but not very much. So, so we'd expect dividends to come down the line later on. Now, what about SDG&E? Right. It's a defensive stock because people don't want to take cold showers in the dark. And they pay a decent income. You know, not too bad. Who are General Mills? Also, by the way, what does sdg &E sitting on? They sit on a lot of land. They own a lot of land in San Diego County. So they're also an asset play. General Mills, what do they make? Cheerios, Wheaties. They make foodstuffs. And so... They are a, a defensive stock, and I think they pay a pretty good dividend. I haven't looked at it lately, but they're also a blue chip. They've been around for over 100 and some odd years. I forget. International paper, what do you think they make? Well, they make paper, but they also make wood products. They also make timber, because when you make paper, you also make timber. They're, they're, you know, they're the same material, and so they're very cyclical, and they're a blue chip. They've been around forever. How about Union Pacific Railroad, a railroad company? What would you, where would you put them? Well, they're one of the blue chips. They've been, you know, they've been around for more than all the other companies around. Uh, uh, the blue chip, yes, but they're also very cyclical. Why? Because before the stuff can be made, it's got to get to where it needs to go, and then after it's made, it's got to get back. So, so they follow the uh, the cycle of the business. In fact, many people look at the railroads and the airlines and the transportation companies as a leading indicator of if the, if the economy is going to do well or the economy is doing poorly. But what else are you, what else are they? They're also a huge asset play because they own tremendous amounts of land that was given to them by the federal government 170 years ago or whatever. Right. Now, what about General Motors? <laughs> Used to be one of the bluest of the blue companies, but then they just kept shooting themselves in the foot, left side, right side. And in 2006, I was looking around saying, you know, they're going to go bankrupt. And, I, and that was the time that the CEO was saying, let's, we don't want to hear any this story about us going bankrupt. We just don't want to hear it. And then two years later, they went bankrupt. So they became, <laughs> they used to be, they still are, they still are a cyclical company. Cars are cyclical. But they also became a turnaround. And so far, it looks like they've done pretty well. They're actually selling more Buicks in China than they're selling in the United States. So they're trying to become a global player and they're, they're handling it. What about Flim Flam Incorporated? They sell blue steam. It's really cool, folks. It's, it's going to be a whole lot better than their previous product, which was a left-handed smoke shifter, which didn't do very well. And then the bacon stretcher really didn't do very well. Right. It's a penny stock. It's a scam. Don't believe them. You don't even never heard of them, but it's only selling for two cents. You could buy a whole bunch for two cents and it goes down to 0.02 cents and you've lost 99.99% of your value. And then what about General Dynamics? Who are they? Huh? If you're going down to the NASCO shipyard, now the General Dynamics keeps getting bigger and the NASCO keeps getting smaller and smaller. They're a defense contractor. Yeah, they do make bullets and planes and, and jet aircraft and, and, and submarines and all kinds of stuff like that. Where do you put them? Hmm? Well, many people would call them a blue chip company, but they're also a cyclical company, but not, they don't follow the cycle of the, of the business cycle it, with recessions and, and growth spurts. They follow geopolitical cycles, how much uh, you know, wars are going on and the like. So there's an example of a company that's very difficult to, to, to pigeonhole. Cool. So, so if this piques your interest, then consider 
thinking about business 123 introduction investments where we go into much more detail about the different types of stocks and we ask you to research different types of stocks we're going to do it we're going to ask you to do a little research okay a little bit but not much are you excited i hope so go back over make sure you understand this and we're ready for our next presentation where we will start to discuss the 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 places that stocks are sold, how they're sold, and start to look at some of the measurements of how we can value a stock and, and say, well, what are you really worth, Mr. Stock? Well, Miss Stock, what, 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 what can we reasonably expect from you in the future? Cool? Okay. Uh, questions, you know who to contact. Dear students, we are so, so very proud of you for making this making it this far. You are awesome.